The two old men moved in the third floor darkness. Don't check the numbers, said Fox. Let's guess which apartment is hers. Behind the last door, a radio exploded. The ancient paint shuddered and flaked softly onto the worn carpet at their feet. The men watched the entire door jitter with vibration in, in its grooves. They looked at each other and nodded grimly. Another cut like an axe through the paneling, a woman shrieking at someone across town on a telephone. No phone necessary. She should just open her window and yell, Fox rapped. The radio blasted out the rest of its song. The voice bellowed. Fox rapped again and tested the knob. To his horror, the door got free of his grasp and floated swiftly inward, leaving them like actors trapped on stage when a curtain rises too soon. Oh, no, cried Shaw. They were buried in a flood of sound. It was like standing in the spillway of a dam and pulling the gate lever. Instinctively, the old men raised their hands, wincing as if the sound were pure blazing sunlight that burnt their eyes. The woman, it was indeed Mrs. Shrike, stood at the wall phone, saliva flying from her mouth at an incredible rate. She showed all her large white teeth, chunking off her monologue, nostrils flared, a vein in her wet forehead ridged up, pumping, her free hand flexing and unflexing itself. Her eyes were clenched shut as she yelled, Tell that damned son-in-law of mine I won't see him. He's a lazy bum. Suddenly, the woman snapped her eyes wide, some animal instinct having felt rather than heard or seen the intrusion. The intrusion. She continued yelling into the phone, meanwhile piercing her visitors with a glance forged of the coldest steel. She yelled for a full minute longer, then slammed down the receiver and said without taking a breath, Well! The two men moved together for protection. Their lips moved. Speak up! cried the woman. Would you mind, said Fox, turning the radio down. She caught the word radio by lip reading, still glaring at them once still glaring at them out of her sunburnt face. She slapped the radio without looking at it as one slaps a child that cries all day every day and has become an unseen pattern of life. The radio subsided. I'm not buying anything! She ripped a dog-eared packet of cheap cigarettes like it was a bone with meat on it, snapped one of the cigarettes in her smeared mouth and lit it, sucking greedily on the smoke and jetting it through her thin nostrils until she was a feverish dragon confronting them in a fire-clouded room. I got work to do. Make your pitch. They looked at the magazine, spilled like great catches of catches of ah. They looked at the magazine, spilled like great catches of bright colored fish on the linoleum floor, the unwashed coffee coffee cup near the broken rocking chair, the tilted, greasy thumb marked lamps, the smudged window panes, the dishes piled in the sink under a steady dripping dripping faucet the cobwebs floating like dead skin in the ceiling corners, and over all of it, the thickened smell of life lived too much too long with the window down. They saw the wall thermometer, temperature, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. They gave each other a half-startled look. I'm Mr. Fox, and this is Mr. Shaw. We're retired insurance salesmen. We still sell occasionally to supplement our retirement fund. Most of the time, however, we're taking it easy and you trying to sell me insurance? She cocked her head at them through the cigarette smoke. There's no money connected with this, no. Keep talking, she said. I hardly know how to begin. May we sit down? He looked about and decided there wasn't a thing in the room he would trust himself to sit on. Never mind. He saw she was about to bellow again, so went on swiftly. We retired after forty years of seeing people from nursery to cemetery gate, you might say. In that time, we formul we'd formulated certain opinions. Last year, sitting in a park talking, we put two and two together. We realized that many people didn't have to die so young. With the correct investigation, a new type of customer's information might be provided as a sideline by insurance companies. I'm not sick, said the woman. Oh, but you are, cried Mr. Fox, and then put two fingers in to his mouth in dismay. Don't tell me what I am, she cried. Fox plunged headlong. Let, let me make it clear. People die every day, psychologically speaking. Some part of them gets tired, and that small part tries to kill off the entire person. For example, he looked about and seized on the first evidence of what, with what amounted to vast relief there. That light bulb in your bathroom hung right over the tub on a frayed wire. 
Someday you'll slip and make a grab and... <laughs> Mrs. Albert J. Shrike squinted at the light bulb in the bathroom. So? People, Mr. Fox warmed to his subject while Mrs. Well, Mr. Shaw fidgeted, his face now flushed, now dreadfully pale, edged toward the door. People, like cars, need their brakes checked, their emotional brakes, do you see? Their lights, their batteries, their approaches and responses to life, Mrs. Shrike snorted. Your two minutes are up, I haven't learned a damn thing! Mr. Fox blinked, first at her, then at the sun burning mercilessly through the dusty window panes. Perspiration was running in, soft in the soft lines of his face. He chanced to look at the wall thermometer. Ninety-one, he said. What's eating you, Pop? asked Mrs. Shrike. I beg your pardon. He stared in fascination at the red-hot line of mercury firing up the small glass vent across the room. Sometimes we all make wrong turnings, our choice of marriage partners, a wrong job, no money, illness, migraine headaches, grandeur, glandular deficiencies, dozens of little prickly, irritable things before you know it. You're talking it out on the, you're taking it out on everyone, everywhere. She was watching his mouth as if he were t talking a foreign language. She scowled, she squinted, she tilted her head, her cigarette smoldering in one plump hand. We run about, screaming, making enemies. Fox swallowed and glanced away from her. We make people want to see us gone, sick, dead even. People want to hit us, knock us down, shoot us. It's all unconscious, though, you see? God, it's hot in here, he thought. If there were only one window open, just one, just one window open. Mrs. Shrike's eyes were widening, as if to allow in everything he said. Some people are not only accident-prone, which means... They want to punish themselves physically for some crime, usually a petty immorality they think they've long forgotten, but their subconscious puts them in a dangerous situation, makes them jaywalk, makes them, he hesitated and sweat dripped from his chin, makes them ignore frayed electric cords over bathtubs. They're potential victims. It is marked in their, on their faces, hidden, like tattoos, you might say on the inner rather than outer skin, a murderer passing one of these accident prones, these wishers after death would see the invisible markings turn and follow them instinctively to the nearest alley. With luck, a potential victim might not happen to cross the tracks of a potential murderer for 50 years. Then one afternoon, fate, these people, these death prones, touch all the wrong nerves in passing strangers. They brush the murder in all our, the murder in all our breasts. Mrs. Shrike mashed her cigarette in a dirty saucer very slowly. Fox shifted his cane from one trembling hand to the other. So it was that a, so it was that a year ago we decided to try to find people who needed help. These are always the people who don't even know they need help, who never dream of going to a psychiatrist. At first I said, we'll make a dry run. Shaw was always against it, save as a hobby. A harmless, quiet thing between ourselves. I suppose you'd say I'm a fool. Well, I've just completed a year of dry runs. We watched two men, studied their environmental factors, their work, marriages at a discreet distance. None of our business, you say, but each time the men came to a bad end. One killed in a bar room, another pushed out a window. A woman we studied run down by a streetcar. Coincidence? What about the old man accidentally poisoned? Didn't turn on the bathroom light one night. What was there on his mind that wouldn't let him turn the light on? What made him move in the dark and drink medicine in the dark and die in the hospital next day? Protested he wanted nothing but to live. Protesting he wanted nothing but to live. Evidence. Evidence. We have it. We have it. Two dozen cases. Coffins nailed and a good half of them in that little time. No more dry runs. It's time for action. Prevent preventative use of data. Time to work with people. Make friends before the undertaker slips in the side door. Mrs. Shrike stood as if he had struck her on the head, quite suddenly, with a large weight. Then, just her blurred lips moved. And you came here? Well, you've been watching me? We only... Following me? In order to... Get out, she said. We can. Get out, she said. If you'll only listen, 
Oh, I said this would happen, whispered Shaw, shutting his eyes. Dirty old men, get out, she shouted. There's no money involved. I'll throw you out. I'll throw you out, she shrieked, clenching her fists, gritting her teeth, her face colored insanely. Who are you dirty old grandpas coming here spying you old cranks, she yelled. She seized the straw hat from Mr. Fox's head. He cried out. He tore the lining from it. She tore the lining from it, cursing. Get out! Get out! Get out! Get out! She hurled it on the floor. She crunched one heel through the middle. She kicked it. Get out! Get out! Oh, but you need us. Fox stared in dismay at the hat as she swore at him in a language that turned corners blazing then flew in the air like a like great searching torches like great searing torches the woman knew every language and every word in every language she spoke with fire and alcohol and smoke who do you think you are god god and the holy ghost passing on people snooping prying you old jerks you old dirty minded grandmas you you she gave them Further names, names that forced them toward the door in shock, recoiling. She gave them a long, vile list of names without pausing for breath. Then she stopped, gasped, trembled, heaved in a great suction of air, and started a further list of ten dozen even viler names. See here, said Fox, stiffening. Shaw was out the door, pleading with his partner to come along. It was over and done. It was as he had expected. They were fools. They were everything she said they were. Oh, how embarrassing. All maid, shouted the old woman. I'll thank you to keep a civil tongue. All maid, all maid. <coughs> Excuse me. Somehow this was worse than all the really vile names. Fox swayed. His mouth clapped open, shut open. Old woman, she cried. Woman, woman, woman! He was in a blazing yellow jungle. The room was drowned in fire. It clenched about him. The furniture seemed to shift and whirl about. The sunlight shot through the rammed shut windows, firing the dust which leaped up from the rug in angry sparks when a fly buzzed a crazy spiral from nowhere. Her mouth, a foul, her mouth, a feral red, a feral red things, licked a licked the air with all the obscenities collected just behind it in a lifetime. And beyond her, on the baked brown wallpaper, the thermometer said 92. And he looked again, and it said 92. And still the woman screamed like the wheels of a train scraping around a vast iron curve of track, fingernails down an old blackboard. All made! All made! All made! Fox drew his arm back, cane clenched in his fist, very high, and struck. No, cried Shaw from in the doorway.